welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ in La Crosse, Wisconsin. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to this worship celebration for the second Sunday of Easter, April 11, 2021. If you are joining us this morning through the link shared in the e-greeting, I remind you that the additional link is there to a PDF file which provides you the entire order of service and the hymns and other music that we are singing this morning so that you can participate, pray, and sing with us that we worship together even as we are scattered in this time of pandemic. We continue to work toward the day in which we can begin to regather in person and hope that that will come soon. Until then, we want to say thank you for your continued financial support and other support of our mission and ministries in these days. A reminder that you can share gifts with us by mailing a check to the church office at 2503 Main Street in La Crosse, Wisconsin. 54601. You can also make an online donation by going to our website, www.firstcongolax.org. There on the website, you'll see a Give tab. Click on that, follow the prompts, and you can make a gift and designate the gift in various ways to be used. Again, thank you for your faithful support in these ways and other ways so that our mission and ministry continues. You'll also be hearing a little bit about that in a stewardship moment from Amanda Brower, the chairperson of our Ministry of Christian Education today. And I invite you to listen to the ways she shares and tells us about the work that has been going on in this past year that has been so unusual for us as a congregation. And now as we prepare to worship together, let us find that place within us, particularly open to the Spirit, listening for our still speaking God, making our praise and thanksgiving to God in spirit, in honesty, in celebration of the new life shared with us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us worship God together.
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia!
Peace be with you. Peace be with you. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. We will join in reading responsibly from Psalm 133 as printed in the order of service. How good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there God ordained the blessing, the blessing of life forevermore. A reading from the Gospel according to John in chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and hit my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In the poem, Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front, Wendell Berry's Mad Farmer warns against the love of the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay, a life which makes one afraid to know your neighbors and to die. Instead, the Mad Farmer exhorts us 
every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, and finally, practice resurrection. The disciples that we encounter in John's Gospel this morning were not there yet. It is the evening of Easter Day, but they are unable to practice resurrection. They are locked in a room, afraid of dying. Mary has told them that she has seen the Lord risen from the dead, but her witness fails to penetrate the gloomy, terrifying reality that Jesus had been brutally executed and that they may well be next. Perhaps it is not so much that they do not believe Mary, but that they cannot even comprehend what her words might mean. How often does one encounter resurrection? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Crucifixion they understood. The occupying Roman government was good at supplying fresh evidence of that. But resurrection was a pipe dream, or at best, a theological concept. It's not something they know firsthand. Then suddenly Jesus is there, in the locked room, saying something altogether ordinary and yet completely absurd. Peace be with you. A common, ordinary greeting, peace be with you. But an unlikely reality in this situation. Peace is one thing those locked in the room have not experienced in the week past. Their experience has been a whirlwind of praise and derision, intimacy and treachery, welcome and farewell, loyalty and betrayal, hope and despair. And will the appearance of their dead teacher bring them any peace? Not likely, it would seem. Peace be with you. For Jesus, these words are much more than a simple greeting. For according to John's Gospel, these words are a promise that Jesus made when he was last together with his disciples. Words from what is often called his farewell discourse in John's Gospel. Words often read and heard at funerals. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. He said a lot more that night, and all of it seems to say that no matter what the world handed to them, no matter what the threat they faced, they would share in this amazing peace. But simply saying it, had not made it so in their reality. The reality for the disciples is that they are not at peace. They are locked in a room fearing for their lives. They are locked into their doubt of what Mary had reported. So now the risen Jesus is back to make good on a promise. Peace be with you. For as you can see, there is more to life than death. And he shows them the holes in his hands and his side. They can see that this is Jesus who was crucified, and yet he stands before them a living, breathing reality, wearing the marks of violence as witness to the reality of his death. They know him, they recognize him by his wounds. Peace be with you. And he breathes on them. Just as a creator once breathed life into their ancestors, he breathes into them his own mission by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you'll notice that John's chronology is not Luke's chronology. There is no 50-day wait until Pentecost in John's Gospel. 
Here they are on that first Easter evening, and they receive the Holy Spirit directly from the warm, moist breath of Jesus. And with it, they receive their commission. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. They now share both the power and the responsibility of a ministry once reserved only to God. <clears throat> this is the moment when disciples become apostles. Followers become leaders, messengers, instigators. And what is more, they are entrusted with the power of forgiveness. They are called into the world where good and evil contend and they are called to contend with the sin and brokenness to make it holy through the inbreathed power of the Holy Spirit. To forgive. That is nothing less than the good news that they too can practice resurrection. It is counterintuitive and countercultural. This past Monday, the day after, I made a quick run to the grocery store. Clerks were busily clearing the shelves of any vestiges of Easter. The card rack was already empty and the chocolates were randomly tossed into a 50% off bin. I confess that I indulged the opportunity. But you have the power to forgive. But the church is unique and countercultural way of marking time, which we call the liturgical year, reinforces this core understanding of Easter that we experience in John's Gospel. Easter is not over. Resurrection continues unabated. In the, the liturgical calendar, based partly on Luke's chronology, of course, Easter is not one Sunday, but seven Sundays, a week of Sundays, culminating in the eighth Sunday, Pentecost, an eighth day of creation. Easter is certainly not over in John's Gospel or for the disciples, soon to be apostle, Thomas, the patron saint of all of us who were not there that Easter evening. It's not easy to live into the reality of Easter without evidence. Yet even those who had seen him a week later, we still find them gathered behind closed doors. Christ greets them again, peace be with you, as if to affirm that there is so much more to this world than meets the eye. Christ invites Thomas, present this time, to touch to feel the physicality of this reality. But notice that John does not record that Thomas did so. It certainly provided plenty of fodder for artists for centuries, the depictions of Thomas feeling the wounds, but that's not what John says happened. John says instead that Thomas simply responds with the acclamation, my Lord and my God. Christ offers Thomas and every one of us who come after him the opportunity to believe in something more than just what we can see and touch. The opportunity to believe in a truth too good to be true. The opportunity to trust in what we come to know in ways beyond the merely physical and ultimately, the opportunity to practice resurrection. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But there, these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Some have suggested that this may be where the Gospel of John ended originally. But of course, we want to know more. 
What happened when they unlocked the doors and, like the mad farmer, headed out to practice resurrection? So in fact, we get another chapter of John, at least in its final iteration known to us. Still, we wonder what happened. What happened when they unlocked the doors and practiced resurrection? For those pictures, we often turn to the Acts of the Apostles and some of the letters in the New Testament, which describe how early believers put it into practice. And one classic description of that practice that we get in the Easter season is found in the mention of the Jerusalem church that you heard Laura read this morning. They were of one heart and soul. They shared everything. They testified with power. Grace was upon them all. It sounds pretty idyllic to those of us who have experienced the church as a slightly more contentious reality. It also sounds suspiciously like com communism. This passage never preached well when I was growing up in the Cold War, and I think it still does not preach well in our culture of individualism, consumerism, and unchecked capitalism. Surely a system like this would not work for us. But suspend disbelief for a moment. Thomas would surely ask us to do that. And imagine what it might have been like. Empowered by the Spirit, they lived the radical claim of resurrection. That fear had been buried in the empty tomb. They practiced resurrection in their whole lives. Because people free from death well, they're free to sell off the business they've been putting together for their descendants. People free from death are free to cash in the life insurance if somebody is in need. People free from death do not have to build their security on the backs of a service class below them. There was power in their testimony because they lived differently. These Christians were a little weird. When they encountered skeptics who needed proof, you know what they did? They invited them home to dinner. That's how they practiced resurrection. So much for a division between saving souls and feeding the hungry. They didn't even bother to have separate responsibilities for the ministry of Christian education and the ministry of building and grounds. The realists among us, among us like me, will remind us that there were a whole lot of other expressions of the church described in the New Testament. Most were a lot more cantankerous. Just ask Paul, who had to write several memos and try to quell the brouhaha's with his letters. The realists among us, like me, will remind you that this bold utopian experiment in the Jerusalem church went the way of most such utopian experiments. Before long, the Jerusalem church was bankrupt and had to be bailed out by special collections taken up at churches in other cities who were more financially solvent, more prudent, perhaps. It's so hard for us realists to practice resurrection sometimes. But you know, maybe there is something good that these days of pandemic have brought us. Because think about it. The gospel today describes disciples gathered behind closed doors in fear. Jesus appears, wounds intact, but somehow alive, and commissions them to step out from their fear and from behind those closed doors and practice resurrection. Despite this experience that was surely transformative, a week later, it seems that nothing had changed. There they are, still gathered behind closed doors. But you see, during these days of COVID-19 pandemic, the church doors have closed, but not with us inside. 
The church has been forced out of its closed door gatherings that we're so used to. Now folks worship with us from other states. And while some have experienced this time as one of loss and diminishment, others have found creative ways to practice resurrection, to do things that don't compute, to be out there. This week in the news, I met Dr. Laverne Wimberly. Perhaps you did too. I think she was on a number of broadcasts this Easter weekend. Wimberly is an 82-year-old retired teacher, principal, and school administrator in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when the pandemic caused her church to begin holding only virtual worship services online, sound familiar, she told reporters, I just decided at that point, I'm going to get dressed up as if I were going to church, so that I would not get in the habit of slouching around. Since then, she has not missed a service or an opportunity to dress in her Sunday best, including a marvelous hat with every outfit. She tracks her outfits in a journal and posts pictures on her Facebook page each week with a word of encouragement for her followers. She says, I wanted not only to keep myself motivated, but I wanted to help keep others motivated as well, to inspire them, encourage them, and kind of eradicate some types and forms of depression, isolation, fear, and despair. Dr. Wimberly continues to practice resurrection in her own unique way and hopes to return to church when it is safe. Meanwhile, her closet is running out of space for her hats. I suppose too many of us, to, to many of us, it doesn't compute. But that's how it is. Resurrection people do things that don't compute. The church described in Acts does not compute to most of us realists. Most of our churches don't look like that. But nevertheless, most of them have the capacity to ignore their realistic limitations and practice resurrection, if they're willing to risk. And most of them have the capacity to become extinct if they are careful and prudent and realistic. So take the mad farmer's advice. Risk that. Every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, practice resurrection. Amen.
In some of our communion prayers, the congregation affirms our resurrection hope with the words, Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Jesus, come in glory. As we gather in the work of prayer, may this hope guide our hearts and our deeds. We are invited to examine the wounds, not only in the risen one, to know the depth of your love for us, but you call us to feel the wounds of your world as well. Grant us strength to practice love, healing, and resurrection in the broken places and people around us. Merciful God, hear, hear our prayer. The apostles received the Holy Spirit and the grace to lighten the burdens of one another's sin. May we be faithful to this gift. Help us to live with abundant compassion for all, especially those at the margins of society. Merciful God, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to resurrection faith. Increase our witness to resurrection in all the aspects of our lives, that we might give courage to all who live in doubt or despair. Merciful God, hear, hear our prayer. Strengthened by new life in Christ, we pray for all who are in need. We pray for Bob, Kalen, Joanne, Jenny, Andy, Adeline, Carol, Eileen, Heather, Leanna, and for those we name in our hearts and those known only to you. May all for whom we pray know the power of resurrection. Merciful God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Eternally creative God, give us faith and courage to practice resurrection, that your will may be known on earth and among all people. We pray as the risen one taught us. Our Father, Father Mother, who art Lord in heaven, hallowed Lord, be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we welcome Amanda Brower to share with us a few moments about stewardship, about the ways in which we as a community have cared for those, especially those in terms of faith formation and education in these days when we have been scattered in unable to gather as we are used to. But welcome, Amanda. Hi. I'm Amanda Brower, and as chair of the Christian Education Committee and as a parent of little ones, I want to take this stewardship moment to share with you how our Jam Club families have been worshiping and staying connected in this time while we are apart. I also wanted to share with you some opportunities to give your time and talents to this fantastic ministry of our church. 
Before we begin, on behalf of the Jam Club families, I first need to take a moment to show our abundant gratitude for the incredible work and creativity of Flora, our faith formation leader, who has worked tirelessly to keep this ministry and programming alive. We appreciate you, Laura. Thank you. During COVID, our Jam Club ministry has centered around our approach to worship using the Children in Worship curriculum. We invite families to watch our YouTube Jam Worship service, where leaders invite the kids, and adults too, to experience the wonder and mystery of God through a unique storytelling format with multi-sensory materials. Like we have in our adult worship, the kids have a certain order to their worship. We start with a greeting. Welcome to the Worship Center. The Worship Center is a very special place. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And sing songs in preparation for worship. Next, we hear God's word through the telling of a Bible story and engaging with wondering questions about the story. Then we respond. In pre-COVID times, this would be crafting, coloring, and retelling the story with the materials in our Jam Club classroom. But during COVID times, we've had to be a bit more creative. Laura has been putting together weekly activities that correspond to the Jam Worship story and has been delivering them to each Jam Club family. We call them the porch bags. These are thoughtful, delightful, and highly engaging activities for kids and families to experience the stories. Examples of these activities include building the temple with Lego candies after learning about how the Israelites created a house for God, constructing God's people from pretzels and marshmallows, and then helping them cross the Red Sea. In this case, it was blue jello. And crafting and sharing these activities with others to help experience the stories in a different way. In the season of Lent, we are learning more about who Jesus is as we are preparing for the story of Easter. Using crafting materials like Play-Doh, wood blocks, and clay, we have started with a road and a destination of Jerusalem. Each week, as Jesus journeys to Jerusalem, we learn about who Jesus encounters and how he accepts them. When others say, don't bother Jesus, Jesus welcomes them, whether this be the beggar Bartimaeus or the little children. The kids have been creating the story characters, and then they get a chance to interact and retell the stories in their own way. Here's a clip of my daughter, Annabelle, who is three, retelling how Jesus wanted the little children to come to him. You can come. <sighs> Jesus said they could come. <sighs> After our response time, we then have a time of thanksgiving and prayer where we read the story in the Bible and pray together. We end our virtual worship experience with a benediction, warming our benediction hands, lifting them high and saying, The love of God go with you. Go in peace. Amen. The porch bags also include ways to connect with other kids and members of the congregation. One way this is achieved is through sharing birthday greetings. Each month, we get a list of other Jam Club kids and senior congregational members who are celebrating, and we send a postcard, we decorate it, and send it to them. It's a great way to remind us about our larger congregational family. As we continue with this ministry, we are offering some opportunities for you to give your time and talents to connect with Jam Club families. Right now, we are looking for help packing and delivering porch bags for the kids. To facilitate this in a distant, friendly way, Laura has organized a drop-in time every other Thursday from 4 to 5.30, starting on March 25th. These are to help put the activities together. We welcome you to drop by the community room for a bit during this time to help pack and deliver bags. If you can't do it then, but would still like to offer support for the program, contact Laura and she will get you connected. Thank you for considering helping with this ministry. We look forward to seeing you all again soon.
hearing the praises of God who has called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.